right, so um, really, um, this is the title of my talk, Sorting Through the Weed, the Use of Cannabis and IBD. Does that sound better? I thought so. Um, it really is kind of sorting through the weed because there's not a lot of good data, as you know, out there. But um, I had some interesting conversations. And um, I've had interesting conversations with my, our patients. You know, in Washington State, it became uh, legal for medical marijuana probably, oh gosh, seven, eight years ago, I think now. Um, and uh, then it legalized shortly after that for recreational marijuana. And you would be surprised, there is probably not a patient today that has IBD that comes in that doesn't say that they use marijuana, because that's a sp separate question now in their questionnaire when they come in. Um, so most of them use it at some point. Now, whether they use it medically or whether they use it recreational really doesn't matter. Uh, most of the uh, medical places have now closed because it's cheaper for them to get it recreationally, which I'm not sure why. Um, the regulations aren't any different. They don't grow it any different, but um, they package it different sometimes. But, um, and it's really hard to even get somebody on the phone at a medical place. I called all week to get a place down the street for me because I wanted to go visit, and they never answered their phone. But interesting enough, they have a resource center, which is <laughs> selling <laughs> items next door to them, and they're open. So. so my disclosures, I'm a speaker and a consultant for these companies. So this is our case. So it's a 25-year-old uh, male with Crohn's leitis, diagnosed five years ago with initial weight loss, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. He started on infliximab about six months after diagnosis. And his colonoscopy um, six months ago showed a few shallow ulcers at that time. He comes in today with complaints of abdominal pain and nausea, um, very common for a flare. And during the interview, he says he's been using marijuana for the nausea. So the history of cannabis is pretty interesting. You know, marijuana is really an herb. Cannabinoids are found in the leaves and the flowers and available in many, many forms. Um, it can be smoked, put into foods, eaten, rubbed on you, into oils, baked, what, you know, many, many different forms. And cannabis is a prescription form in uh, Dobanadol, which um, actually uh, Marinol is the brand name, and I've used that before. It was first isolated in Israel in 1964. These are all kinds of products, and everybody has their own and their own label. It's interesting, though, that people can actually make stuff and put it, their own label on it and sell it um, at, at uh, different places. And I don't really know how that's regulated. They don't really say. Um, it, and then they also have several different packages. I, I have a really good patient um, who is a retired policeman, and he had a really hard time. He um, had horrible abdominal cramping and... He said, you know, my IBD is in remission. I know it is on biologic. I feel wonderful. He said, but I can't get rid of these cramps. He goes, and I'm, I'm so afraid. This is, I, I used to bust people in my former life all the time. I don't want to go and do some of these other products. But one of his good friends said, you, you might want to try this. And he found lozenges to suck on. And I said, of all the things you tried, that's probably the best, because he's not smoking it, and he's not eating it. Because if you haven't, done, if you haven't seen EGDs on these people that eat edibles, their stomachs are inflamed. They look as red as marine sweater. Um, and uh, so the lozenges sucking on it really got rid of his cramps, although he felt guilty about it all the time. So it's a plant that came over uh, seven uh, cannabinoids, which have been used for pharmaceutical effects. The cannabidol is the most effective uh, anti-inflammatory and most devoid of central effects. The THC is the most psychotropic and most studied. So there's multiple uses, and there's been multiple um, small uh, studies, although I would say um, most of the studies are, again, are not very well done, and um, they really don't have good uh, benefits. Multiple sclerosis, it does decrease spasticity, um, and um, so this has been used in that way. There's been used in anti-inflammatory, and may uh, have a role in pain relief. Um, interesting, there's a, you know, opioid, uh, is uh, out of control, and we all should uh, be careful about that. But there has been five studies that actually showed if people were using Marinol that they, um, or some type of cannabinoid, that they actually would use less opioid, and there were less um, opioid uh, deaths in those states that did have legalized uh, marijuana. So this research in Huntington's disease, uh, Tourette's disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, epilepsy, bladder dysfunction, and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, controlling nausea and vomiting in patients with chemotherapy. Uh, I've been on chemotherapy. My doctor told me to go get um, marijuana, but um, when you're nausea and vomiting, it's not something that you want to eat or smoke, so I'm not sure how it was going to help me. 
So when it works in uh, IBD, cannabinoids have been known to have an anti-inflammatory effect on the CBT receptor. We all know that. CBT is mainly in the immune cells of the gastrointestinal tract. And it suggests that cannabinoids have a pro-inflammatory effect as well. So why is in Friedenberg using the National Health Institute Nutritional Exam Survey in 2015 uh, reviewed about 2 million IBD and matched controls for the cannabis use? The use was higher in IBD patients is about 67% versus 60%, and male were more predominant um, users. They had higher depression scores, though, and cigarette use and alcohol use was also associated with this. So it wasn't just the marijuana that they were doing, they were also doing other things um, that may have not been helpful for their problem. Um, there's several studies out there. One of them showed the impact of cannabis treatment. Um, this is Layette and all in digestion 2002. They only had 13 patients refractory to treatment. And they prepared these marijuana cigarettes for them. Um, and they used when they were experiencing pain for three months. And they reported an improvement in the pain, social functioning, and the ability to work in depression. And I would say a lot of my patients would agree with that. You know, I can at least get through the day if I can, um, you know, smoke every night. Um, their HBI did decrease from the average of 11 to uh, 2. There's been lots of AGA abstracts. Um, this one was from uh, Naftali. Naftali is probably the one person who's actually researched uh, cannabis the most in IBD um, from Israel. Uh, patients were from a database from the Israel Center for Promotion of Medical Cannabis. Um, 19 Crohn's, 3 ulcerative colitis, and the consumption of cannabis was an average of 2.6 years. All patients had failed ASAs, steroids, uh, methotrexate, and seven of them had uh, failed infliximab. Their average CDI went from 358 um, before use into 139 after use. Um, bowel movements went from 8.6 to 4.3. So some good benefit there. Cannabinoid use decreased ED utilization in GI clinics in a population. And this was a retrospective cohort analyst where they went and showed exposure to drapanolol prescription or home use in a GI clinic for a 27-year period, <laughs> long time, 860 patients. And um, the ED uh, uh, users, or the Drapana users, went uh, to the ED 2.0.1.2 uh, for cannabis users. So functional GI complaints for the Drapana users um, had significantly less ED visits. Cannabis had no effect, um, and there was no impact in IBD. This is another study I found. Again, you notice uh, Naftali et al. Again, uh, randomized control patient who failed steroids, immune suppressants, or TNFs. Again, were uh, put on smoking two cigarettes of cannabis or placebo, and there were 22 patients. 20 completed the study. So again, a very small study. But five patients in the THC uh, group and one in the placebo had a CDA greater than 100. Uh, four steroid-dependent patients in the group stopped steroids during the study, so that was a good thing. And they improved um, appetite and sleep. Another good benefit, right? Uh, randomized control trial, trial again, showing patients receiving CBD in a hard gelatin capsule um, or placebo for 10 uh, weeks. And they had compliance issue because the amount of the uh, CBD was hard on their stomachs. It was hard for them to tolerate. So there was only 59% were compliant with the dosing. Um, they did show some remission that were observed in both groups. Uh, the male score total was uh, greater than two or no um, subscore greater than one. I think that's supposed to be. Um, but they did not meet their primary endpoint. And this was another study found in psychological characteristics and abdominal pain um, with cannabis use. Prospective uh, clinical based study in IBD patients with high volume tertiary care in Chicago. 88 IBD patients completed the survey. 25% reported current cannabis use. 31 said previous cannabis use. And I can't remember what the time frame was there. But the cannabis users were more likely to have psychological distress, higher somatization scores, and tended towards poorer sleep. Interesting. The cannabis users also had a trend towards more severe abdominal pain and were more likely to use alcohol regularly and reported narcotics use as well. So that wasn't a very positive study. 
Lots of um, uh, data all over. These are small populations, so there's not a lot of good of objective data. So there's no endoscopic evaluations of these patients, imaging or laboratory data. Um, we all know that CDI scores work great in studies, but they're not always, you know, um, the same in the pop in the community population. We've long known that cannabis can improve appetite, um, decrease nausea from cancer patients, but we also know the other story as well, and I'll show you some of that. The studies generate a lot of media attention, right? We see that we've seen that in the come out in the paper, and um, you know, cannabis is going to you know cure your Crohn's or cure your whatever, but there's really um, very little hard data. So why not have our patients use cannabis? And what are your prejudices? It's, it was interesting. Is that me or is that the um, new something's moving? Sorry. New England <laughs> Journal of Medicine 2013 actually looked at that. And the medical use of marijuana, they used a case of Annette. It was a 60-year-old female with breast cancer and metastasis, and she was undergoing chemotherapy. And um, they asked a uh, providers what their thoughts were on um, providing a marijuana prescription for this patient. And some of the comments were, well, they would endorse a thoughtful prescription of medical marijuana in this type of situation. Um, and someone said, another one said, you know, well, the physician's terminal, of course I would agree with it. And then someone said, um, if the patient directly, you know, requested it in an environment where the prescription was legal, I would write it. Um, but there were a lot of other negative comments, too. And I think you really have to think about that. I mean, when things changed in our world, we had to think about that because patients started asking us for prescriptions. And our group, um, in particular, decided we weren't going to write prescriptions, but we weren't going to, we wanted to, to know about the patient if they were using it or not. So we were going to ask them that question on their questionnaire. Common side effects, though, are euphoria, dry mouth, paranoia, palpitations, anxiety, memory loss, increased appetite, and drowsiness. And we know that um, drobanadol, which is a Schedule three drug, is a soft capsule, which is, I, I again used it in some patients that had extreme uh, cramps or nausea where nothing else worked. And it, you know the nausea and vomit associated with cancer therapy patients who had failed and responded to adequate conventional antimics, it did work in. Um, it was a, also um, for anorexia, and I've had patients that had a really hard time gaining weight, and I've had it work with them. Um, 2.5 BID with meals, you can increase it, but they often don't tolerate the higher um, doses. But it can cause palpitations, confusion, nausea, abdominal pain, amnesia, somnolence, hallucinations, um, hypertension, depression, and seizures. So there's lots of risk and benefits, and I think you really have to think about that. Um, the FDA, the cannabinoids are likely safe, is what their statement says, when used directed for specific disease states and for a limited time. Marijuana may affect the central nervous system, heart, endocrine, and immune systems as well. It can increase blood alcohol levels when used with alcohol. Um, it can increase the risk of bleeding, affect blood sugars, lower blood pressure, and affect the P450 enzyme system. It can cause diarrhea, indigestion, nausea, and vomiting. So we all know this story, right? We've all seen this in GI is the cannabinoid uh, hyperemesis. The patient comes in and they're just like have horrible nausea and vomiting. It's kind of like cyclic. And they might mention that they're um, you're frequently bathing or showering when you ask them. That's an important thing because that's really a predictor. Um, but they, because they get a relief of the nausea and stuff when they take that really hot shower. The National Institute on Drug Abuse suggests that 30% of the users will have some form of addiction, and that young adults um, greater than 18 are more likely to develop um, the addiction. According to NIH study, the drug abuse is four, time, four million in the U.S. met the criteria for marijuana use disorder in 2015. So there's a lot of other things that we have to think about this. And I think when you're talking with your patients, it may be very useful. Like I said, in that retired um, police officer of mine, it was the most useful thing for him. But um, when I have you know, the 19, 20-year-olds that are smoking it every day because they want to smoke it every day, I'm not sure that it's really helping their disease. So it may be more harmful for them. The American Cancer Society actually says whether it's burning from wood, tobacco, or marijuana, toxins and carcinogens are released. And so um, we will probably hear of lung cancer associated with marijuana use, and that's going to increase over the next 10 years. Just like cigarette smoking, it took a while before we started talking about lung cancer and cigarette smoking. It's going to happen in marijuana use. Um, aspergillus can be grown um, on marijuana as well. So who's picking it? Who's cleaning it? What are the, you know, how's it prepared? 
And then secondhand smoke is also a concern, right? I mean, we all know that there's people smoking with little children in the house. Uh, pediatric poisonings, I don't, I don't know about our pediatric um, nurse practitioners or nurses here, if you're seeing that yet, especially with edible products, right? They're packaged like candy and cookies and that kind of thing. So um, I'm sure they're seeing an increase in pediatric poisonings. Addiction, according again to the NIH, uh, THC is the content, um, is compensated in samples, and it's rise um, from 3.7 average content in 1990 to 6.1 in 2014. So huge difference in the marijuana that our parents smoked and our children are smoking, right? So you need to think that as well. Um, you don't want to have your 80-year-old all of a sudden decide that they're going to smoke marijuana for their um, IBD and not realize that it's a different marijuana than they had, you know, 30 years ago, whatever. Again, we talked about carcinogens. This was actually out of toxicology in 2009. Um, they concluded that results from their study provided evidence that cannabis smoke may be detrimental and actually cause cancer. So we'll, we'll be seeing it, I'm sure. Vehicle accidents, this was according to the Highway Loss Data Institute, um, status report in June 2017. Collision rates compared in Oregon, which is a cannabis state, Washington, Colorado, before and after legalization, so the three big states. Collision claims were compared to neighboring states. Colorado increased 14%, Washington increased 6.2%, and Oregon increased 4.5%. So there is an increase. Um, the laws, as it states right now, use, possession, cultivation, or transportation, it's illegal under the, um, illegal, I'm sorry, under the federal law, but we know that states by states you can actually get away with the regulation, decriminalize it for medical and recreational use. It's legal now in uh, um, Alaska, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, Oregon, Washington for medical and recreational use as of November 2016 off of Wikipedia. And this is the marijuana law, so you can see the darker green is the medical um, approvals and the lighter green are the recreational only areas. Laws in other countries too, so you can't just pack it in your bag and go travel over to Europe. So, but there are countries that it is you can buy it in and you can purchase it in. Uruguay, interesting enough, was the first country to legalize uh, marijuana in 2013. What's the cost, right? I'm like, what are, what are my pa you know patients paying for their copay for their you know PPI or their copay for their biologic was it huge or what is this cost? So in Seattle right now it's $15 a gram and Spokane is only $5 a gram. So. <laughs> Prices as of September, so 2017, the national average was about 13.50 a gram. A soap bar, right? You can get a bar of soap that has uh, cannabis in it, 6.99. Um, a two ounce oil that you can rub on your skin is 23.99. So you might want to get the soap and rub it all over, I guess. And then brownies, depending on what the maker is and what kind of brownie, you know, about five to six dollars was the average. This is, um, I think, one of the most interesting things. This is millions of dollars, you guys, that the um, states are making off of cannabis sales. So this is why all the states are, <laughs> are going to eventually, when they see this, and this is um, Washington state, I mean, the other states will soon uh, come along when they're seeing how much money they're being made. Is it useful? Is it harmful? I mean, you really have to have that discussion uh, with your patient. Like I said, in my one patient, definitely it was useful for him, and I would um, tell him to keep using it. He doesn't take any other medications. He's never asked for narcotics. None of the other medicine worked for men. If he socks on a lozenge once you know, a week or whatever when he has bad cramps, good for him if that makes his life better. It's obviously we need more randomized placebo-controlled trials. I don't know that that's ever going to happen anytime soon. But I think when um, we start seeing lung cancers from these patients, there may be more studies that go on. You got to have an open discussion with your patient. That's why we decided to put it as a checkbox on our list. You know, we we do cigarette smoking, but we also say marijuana use um, because we want to have that uh, discussion with our patients. And you really have to set your prejudices aside. You can't think about it, you know what it was ten years ago. You have to think about what it is today and what it might be helpful for. And what are the options and uh, laws in your state? And know that. Um, all the practices, too, like I said, our practice chose not to write medical marijuana, so we, do, we chose that as a practice, and it may be different from different practices. So this is our case again, the Crohn's ileitis. Six months ago, again, he showed some mild um, changes. So what, what do you think about marijuana in this patient? What are your prejudices against the marijuana? And what is the law in your state and where you practice? And so those are some things to think about. And I didn't bring samples, I'm sorry. I thought I'd get arrested. I thought I'd get arrested in the airport. Aww. Thank you.